Welcome back to another episode of Sailing Ruby Rose with our friend Mike Rees, General Manager and all-round good guy at Corsair Marine International. He pays me a lot of money to say that. <laughs> anyway, today we have questions from patrons about those boats back there. Eight or seven 1370s now? Uh, we've got seven on the floor now. Right. Yeah. So patron-only questions. I have a list here. Apologies, I need to put my nerd bins on to read these because I'm of an age now where spectacles are required. Quick fire questions. And if you have any questions about the 1370, just write them down below. We'll try to get them answered. Mike, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Hey, glad to answer questions. So, yeah. question one from Ian Kopsick, a good patron of ours. Question, other than solar, are you considering wind or water turbines to generate power as an option for the 1370? No, we haven't got anything that we're offering at the moment. I mean, there's, there's technology out there. We have installed hydro generators uh, on some of our smaller boats yep. historically, but um, look, I think we probably do one in 20, I think. We've, we've used some Watton Sea units that we've done but as the pod units. We've done transom mounted, but it's not something that's really very popular at the moment, I have to say. We but, had a Watton Sea on Ruby Rose. Yep. 90% 10% useful. And I'll right. take that bit out. We've also had the wind generators, and over time we found that the increase in solar panel array size, they've phased out the wind because they're noisy and they're a bit of a handle on the, a bit of a thing to handle on the back there. So generally the solar seems to be the, the way forward. And just for our plans, we intend to stick with solar initially and see how it goes. But I think talking to you about the calculations, we have enough solar to run that boat. Okay, question two from Darren Yakima. Is there any maintenance schedule software for both preventative and unscheduled maintenance? There's resources available with the different suppliers. Obviously, Yanmar and Harker, and they all have their maintenance in all their owner's manuals. But we actually don't have that all collated into the software. There is software out there. There are the third party um, providers that can pull that together. We don't offer it yet. It might be something that we can do down the line. Um, and I think this yeah. is important. There's so much technology that's coming into the forefront. I personally am not a big fan of like early adopter technology because it needs maintenance. And if it goes wrong and you're relying on it to sail a boat, it can create more problems than it solves. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question from Jack Chen. Where will Ruby Rose 2 cameras be mounted and which cameras have you chosen? We talked about this earlier and I'm just gonna take this one. We are not having cameras mounted by SeaWind. We will look at this once we have handover. So it'll be post handover, so that's a quick one. Question from Robin Yoko. Almost two years into the build, the 1370 is a lightweight design. Does it look like it will still be a lightweight boat or are there new or different insights that make her heavier? Good question, Rob. That's a good Yoko. question. Yes. Yeah. Focusing on the right things as well, good. As we've been going through the construction, we've actually been checking in on our original calculations, original weight study, and we're actually meeting those targets. So what's happening as we continue through the build process? Options, people are optioning the boat probably more than what we anticipated. There's yep. a lot of options going on. Some of the build specs are, are huge. Anyone ask um, for bowling alley yet? Or a, <laughs> a, a bowl but, dancing uh, bowl? But, but in terms of where we, uh, the design weights fine we're on track with that actually right. slightly under in, in a number of areas we will do a full weight study when we launch the boat obviously yep. do a stability uh, report of that and uh, yeah we're on track for where we should be i'm making the assumption then that once you've actually got a boat launched you'll be able to work out exactly how much she can be loaded with because it was a theoretical loading capacity it, exactly right so the boat goes in the water we do a stability test where we measure the the water line against the boat from there we can then see you know we can also double check our our, uh, our displacement and then we also from there we can understand what the full load capacity will be. Are you still installing the same solar panels as planned two years ago because panels have become more efficient in the last two years? The panel technology is actually the same. Yeah. There's been some incremental increases in efficiency, we're talking smaller percentages, yeah. but essentially yes the, the panels that we've got designed into the boat at the moment as the standard panels and the optional panels are the same ones we've been talking about for probably a year and a half or so now. Yep. What we have been looking at is how to increase the solar uh, array, yep. uh, get more panels on the, on the boat, and we're actually just working through a, a larger array at the moment. I think one thing that I want to put across is that it is not really, uh, this is my view, it's not the boat manufacturer's obligation to increase the solar, it's actually the owner's obligation to reduce power consumption. <laughs> and I think that that needs to be taken. You cannot run a boat like a house. Yeah, it just sure. doesn't work like that. You, you can't. You have to actually understand that your resources are limited. Yeah. And I think that that took us a long while to get our heads around. I think that just the other thing to point out is that we've got we've had a few comparisons. This uh, you know this boat company can get that amount of solar. This boat we we're running diesel engines on the boat, yeah. and we don't we're actually not looking for enough solar 
to run an electric motor at this stage, we have a diesel engine on board. Two, in fact. Well, indeed, indeed yeah. yeah. So, Two bloody great so, diesels. Okay. So, and they produce a lot of power. So we're actually looking for solar for, for a different uh, aspect as to, to electric boats, the full electric boats yep. okay. or hybrids. 5A. RC when working on an eco configuration. This is from Dominic Sattler that allows an electric motor and increased battery storage, looking at rebalancing the boat with a loss of fuel tank. So are you looking for hybrid drives like Nikki and Jason, like Matt and Jessica? The hybrid drives obviously got different types of hybrid drives. Are we looking keenly to see what's happening in the market? Yes, we're always looking at what the latest innovations are. And yes, we've got people just keeping an eye on, on how things are developing. But for us, our energies are about getting production flowing, getting yeah. boats moving. We would be, uh, I don't think we'd be doing the right thing if we're focusing on developing uh, new technologies like that when we've still got so much to do here in terms yeah. of our production. The inline hybrid system is actually not, not new. It has been out there for a while and we're keen to see how it does go in the, in the broader market. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that make sense. Um, but for us, we're, we, we are still promoting what we believe is, is a great product in having the diesel engines with a big solar array for, yeah. for, your, for your living. I mean, and there's also the cost of these things. They don't, they're not cheap, are they? Correct. They're yeah. expensive. Yeah. Okay, uh, Kirsten and Mark, um, RC Wind evaluating the Beta 29 inline electric motor path with larger lithium solar. This is our preferred powertrain if it works on the HH44. Similar sort of question, really. I mean, yeah, we're keeping our eye on it. It looks like it's, a, it's good technology and, and there's nothing better than seeing what actually happens in the field. Right, and the question 5C from Tom Jett, which is exactly the same, electric propulsion, electric propulsion. Yeah. People are super keen on electric propulsion. Our views are pretty stable that we'd never ever want to rely on a gen set because they're bloody unreliable. It doesn't matter who they are, they run too fast, too hard. And if you're relying on a gen set to repower anything, you are creating a weakling in your entire energy management mm. system. My personal opinion, don't flame me alive for this. Okay, um, another question six from Dominic. Will Seawin bring one of their glorious 1370s to a European or UK boat show next year? Yeah, I think we'll have a boat in, uh, in Europe next I think, year, I hope I so. I think we will as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sam from SVA, when will the first five holes splash? To be determined, I think he's believed there's a, we are, we're getting there. Yeah. And as you'll see from the next episode, there is a lot of work going on. There's been a lot of movement. So we still think that Ruby Rose 2 should be early 2023, right? Another question uh, from Sam. As the boat takes shape, it is looking more stern heavy. Where will the balance point be fully loaded? I don't know whether it is getting more stern heavy as we go along. It's coming through as we planned it yeah, to be. That's what I would say. Yeah. Well. There's nothing I can so, say. So essentially yeah. the question is, um, how's the boat being loaded up and how is the, I mean, ultimately you're looking at the, the center of buoyancy being in line with the center of gravity. Yeah. Are we on track? Yes, we are. Good. Um, the stern has, you'll see very wide transoms. Yep. And that's all about giving that sort of buoyancy for load carrying capacity uh, quite, you know, in the forward area. Uh, it's much more fine. Yep. So yes, if, the, if we're putting lots of weight at the back, well, that's why we have the wider transom. Well, one of the reasons why we have the wider transom back there for load carrying capacity. Are we on track where we're supposed to be? Yep. Okay. We all understand that there are supply chain issues everywhere. How are you getting with those? How are you doing with those now? It's interesting how, they, how that, that actually materializes. I think everybody understands, as you say, it's global supply chain, but it, it materializes in different ways. Sure, you've got your standard off the shelf product that we normally buy that uh, toilets, for example, that we normally buy that have gone from a two month to a seven, eight, nine month lead time. Engines are nine month lead time. So you have to be looking down the pipeline significantly when you're doing all of your procurement. Yeah, but that. what actually, another aspect that I'm seeing coming through is, is product development and R&D. So we've got a number of new custom components on this boat and R&D departments in, in our suppliers are overloaded as well. And essentially you've got, you know, you, you've got your, your, your large companies that are doing high volume production and we're saying we'd like to have this custom part developed with you. And they're busy trying to get, they're just focusing on their production, getting their product out. And they've got a squeeze on their development in a similar way that, that oh, yeah, we do. Right. It filters out. So, yeah, so, so, you know, we have custom front opening windows, we have uh, a whole number of customs of stainless components and, it's, and it's, it's very hard to sort of get these components coming through. So yep. new technology and new components coming through from existing suppliers that are in a, a high volume production um, uh, status, it's, it's quite slow to get through. Where you've got new, com new companies with new technology that are, that are 
new to the scene coming through there, they have to produce and they are able to scale up uh, probably a little bit better. But you've also got the different countries. I mean, obviously, we, we get some components out of uh, places like China. China is still in lockdown. We had a, one of our major suppliers only recently, the full factory was closed. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't get uh, material out from them only for a period of three weeks uh, just recently. And that is like, yeah, it's something to be aware of that anything shipping out of China still has to go. And it's not just shipping out of China. It's if you want to take raw materials into China, they're also put into quarantine for a period yeah, of time. Right. So there are still supply chain issues. And I do think that obviously, as you've said, that's without dealing, into, dealing with semiconductors not being available readily, mm. which then has a knock-on effect to anything electronic. But I think we're getting there. Mike and Alison, is there going to be a solar option for hot water? Not on our radar at the moment. Uh, no, we don't, we don't top of that. Um, I have seen it on boats, but it's not something we're doing. Is Sea Wind planning on doing any structural or limit testing during sea trials? For example, test performance at maximum displacement or using load cells on the running standing rigging to validate the design? I don't understand the question, so Mike, I'm going to leave this 100% <laughs> to you, but thanks, Robin. So, oh, no, I do understand. It's a, it's a, it's a, so it's an informed question, I'd say. So certainly, when the boat goes in the water, we do, um, when we do a stability test, we do um, work our way around the boat and we load it up and we see what the heel angle is. We will load the boat down and double check that the submersion rates are okay, because ultimately what you're looking for is a a TPC, tons per centimetre yep. measurement, so we can see how, what the load carrying capacity is like. Also checking the heel and trim when we load the boat up in specific locations. Now, it's kind of old technology, meeting with uh, what, the, what the, the 3D you know, software and modelling uh, should be confirming as well. So just making sure that those all align. Oh, stick a um, load of concrete yeah. blocks in the bilge is actually a good way of working out how it works. Exactly. It, you know, if, it, if it's simple and it works, it exactly. works. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So there's that component, and then there's also, in terms of the sailing aspect, I mean, we'll take it out. And we, we, we wouldn't be planning to do uh, sort of load sails as such, but we will be, you know, our, our goal is to take the boat out and hit rough weather, take it for some thorough testing as best we can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the expression we use is thrashing the tits off it. Indeed. So I think that's what yeah. you want to do. And yeah. that. Obviously, you know, we would test sail a boat hard anyway. As if you watch our previous videos when we were in the Sundays last year, we pushed that boat hard so that we understood the limitations when we came here. Anyway, thank you, Mike. That was pretty useful. And I hope that answered a lot of your questions. We will be doing a patron and a general public live stream very, very soon. So watch this space. Keep your eye down there. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, give us a subscription. Give us a like. Give us a thumbs up. Ask any questions down there. We will try to answer them. And I will be back very soon with a new episode. Thank you once again, Mike. Take care. Thanks, Thanks guys.